Section 3 of The Sikh Religion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sikh Religion Its Gurus, Sacred Writings, and Authors By Max Arthur McAuliffe Volume 1 Section 3 In our time, one of the principal agencies for the preservation of the Sikh religion has been the practice of military officers commanding Sikh regiments to send Sikh recruits to receive baptism according to the rites prescribed by Guru Gobind Singh and endeavour to preserve them in their subsequent career from the contagion of idolatry. The military, thus ignoring or despising the restraints imposed by the civil policy of what is called religious neutrality, have practically become the main hierophants and guardians of the Sikh religion. I have been at great pains and expense to obtain details of the lives of the Bhagats or Indian saints who preceded the Gurus and whose writings are incorporated in the Granth Sahib. But I have not been completely successful. I shall be very grateful to anyone who can add to my information regarding them. The hymns of the Bhagats will in some cases be found different from those preserved in the Hindi and Marathi collections of the saints' compositions in other parts of India. They were taken down by Guru Arjan from the lips of wandering minstrels or followers of the saints. Parallel ideas and expressions to those of the Gurus and the Bhagats may be found in ancient and modern literature, sacred and profane and could be largely quoted. Only a few such comparisons which occurred to the author at the time of writing have been given in the notes to this work. They are intended to show the Catholicity of the Guru's teachings, and they may also occasionally relieve the tedium of perusal. The writers of the Janam Sarkis had no maps to guide them, and accordingly, in some cases, assigned to the Gurus, notably Guru Nanak, impossible itineraries. Accordingly, efforts have been made in this work to revive the Gurus' travels and render them consistent with scientific Indian geography. Should learned Sikhs, after full consideration at a general council, prepare maps of the Gurus' travels, they will be inserted in any future edition of this work. So also should learned Sikhs consider their own accounts of the Gurus, their own order of the Guru's hymns, or their own versions of words or phrases in the Guru's compositions superior to the Gyanis and mine. We shall be pleased to receive their suggestions. H. H. Sir Hira Singh, Malvender Bahadur, the Raja of Naba, has, at considerable expense, caused the 31 Indian rags, or musical measures, to which the hymns of the Gurus were composed, to be written out in European musical notation by a professional musician whom he employed for the purpose. The rags were merging into oblivion, and have been collected with much difficulty by Mahant Gajasing the greatest minstrel of the Sikhs. They will be found at the end of the fifth volume of this work. Though they may sound bizarre to European ears, they will be appreciated by the Sikhs and by many European lovers of art, who regret the loss of the music to which the odes of Pindar and Sappho and the choral exercises of the Greek tragedians were sung. There are also added pictures of the Gurus, as far as ascertainable, of famous Sikh temples, 
and of some scenes memorable in Sikh history. These pictures have been prepared by Bhai Lal Singh under the auspices of the Honourable Tikka Ripudaman Singh, the younger heir to the Nabagaddi. The expense attendant on the production of this work, which has been the labour of many years and has been completed with the assistance for long periods of a large staff, of six scholars and of English and vernacular copyists, has been very considerable, and I am indebted to His Highness the Raja of Naba, His Highness Sir Rajinder Singh, the late much lamented Maharaja of Patiala, His Highness Raja Ranbir Singh, Raja of Jhind, the Tika Sahib of Naba, and the late Sardar Ranjit Singh of Chichroli for defraying a portion of it. His Highness the Gaikwar of Baroda has promised his patronage after the publication of the work. Several persons have recommended this work to the patronage of the Indian government and the Secretary of State for India. The distinguished scholar Count Angelo de Gubernatis President of the Roman Congress of Orientalists, thus addressed the Secretary of State for India in a letter dated October 19, 1899. Dans l'intérêt de la science, je prends la liberté de vous signaler pour particulièrement à votre attention la proposition de Monsieur Macauliff a créé avec tant intérêt et si chaleureusement recommandé par l'Assemblée générale du 12 Congrès des Orientalistes dans sa séance du 8 octobre pour édition et illustration critique des textes de la religion des Sikhs. Tout ce que l'India office décidera en faveur de cette noble entreprise ne pourra être que très méritoire. Et à ce titre, Josuima recommandé à la protection de l'India office les intéressants Recherche de M. Macaulif sur les textes canoniques des Sikhs du Punjab. Count de Gubernatis's letter covered the following proceedings of the Royal Congress. À propos de la conférence de M. Macaulif, M. le professeur Lufon Schroeder, professeur de sanskrit à l'Université de Vienne, estime qu'il serait très désirable de procéder à une traduction des livres sacrés des Sikhs tels que M. Macaulif on a conçu le plan et préparé l'exécution traduction dans laquelle se trouverait incorporé et utilisé la tradition orale des Sikhs au même qui menace de disparaître rapidement. Il recommande instamment l'entreprise de M. Mekhalif à l'appui matériel tant du gouvernement de l'Inde que du chef Sikh. Ce appui a été autrefois généreusement accordé à la tentative méritoire mais insuffisante de Dr. Trump, il peut se assurer le succès d'une œuvre aussi considérable et aussi coûteuse. M. Émile Sénat, membre de l'Institut de France et vice-président de la Société asiatique à Paris, à son tour demande à appuyer la proposition faite par M. von Schroeder et prie la réunion de recommander un instrument à l'appui soit du gouvernement de l'Inde, soit des chiffres sikhs, L'entreprise de M. Macaulif, il insiste sur l'intérêt spécial que présent dans l'histoire religieuse de l'Inde, le développement de la religion des Sikhs, la seule qui ait pris l'allure militante et guerrière que ne semblait pas faire prévoir ce début. Le plus essentiel de la traduction projectée sera dans cette circonstance qu'elle préservera d'une perte menaçante la tradition orale et l'interprétation orthodoxe. Nulle part, la tradition n'a plus d'importance que dans une doctrine comme celle-ci qui est voilée d'un syncrétisme compliqué et dont l'originalité spéculative ne peut se dégager que peu à peu. Lord Ray, the president of the Royal Asiatic Society, a nobleman who is never wanting to any benevolent or philanthropic enterprise, strongly recommended my work to the favourable consideration of the Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab, 
Mr. L. W. Dane, now Sir Louis W. Dane, Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab, has always adopted a sympathetic attitude towards my labours, and as far as in him lay, assisted in bringing them to a successful conclusion. And Lord Kitchener of Khartoum, after presiding at my public lecture on how the Sikhs became a militant people, thus expressed himself. It must be a matter of great satisfaction to Mr. McAuliffe that the Amritsar Singh Sabha have accepted his translations as being thoroughly accurate. We may say with confidence that in putting the study of the Sikh sacred writings within our reach, Mr. McAuliffe has earned the approbation of all who know the great value of the Sikh soldier, the cordial recognition of the rulers of the country, and the gratitude of the chiefs, sardars, and people of the Sikh community, a feeling of gratitude which I feel sure will be much increased when Mr. McAuliffe has translated the sacred writings into the ordinary Punjabi of the day, a labour which I understand he is about to commence, and which I hope will result in their general dissemination through every Sikh household in the country. For literary assistance, I must acknowledge my indebtedness to Sardar Gahan Singh of Nabha, one of the greatest scholars and most distinguished authors among the Sikhs, who by order of the Raja of Nabha accompanied me to Europe to assist in the publication of this work and in reading the proofs thereof. To Divan Leela Ram Watanmal, a subordinate judge in Sindh, to the late Bhai Shankar Deyal of Faizabad, to Bhai Hazara Singh, and Bhai Sardul Singh of Amritsar, to the late Bhai Dit Singh of Lahore, and to the late Bhai Bhagwan Singh of Patiala, and to many other Sikh scholars for the intelligent assistance they have rendered me. In my translation from the Sikh sacred writings, I freely use the subjunctive mood, which is fast disappearing from the English language. The solemn form of the third person singular of the present tense I have employed for obvious reasons. My Sikh readers may easily learn that this form is not now used in conversation or ordinary prose. I have avoided the arbitrary nomenclature invented by European scholars, such as Brahmanism, a word which is not used in India, self for soul, or conscious, etc. The Sikh gurus were simple men, who generally chose colloquial language for the expression of their ideas, and avoided learned words and metaphysical subtleties. Hence, in my translation, I have endeavoured to use such simple language as I believe was intended by them and the reformers who preceded them. My aim has been to interpret the sacred books of the Sikhs subject to what I deem a necessary solemnity of form in the current language of the day and without any effort to produce new or startling expressions. In my efforts to use simple language, however, I cannot claim complete success. The ideas of the gurus, and particularly their epithets of the creator, cannot always be translated without unwieldy periphrasis into any Anglo-Saxon words in ordinary use. Somewhat analogous words and expressions may often be found, but they do not convey precisely the meanings intended by the Sikh sacred writers. Archaisms, though deemed necessary by poets, and though they often contribute to ornateness of style, I have done my utmost to avoid. In this way, I hope my book will be more useful to the Sikhs, and assist them in forming any acquaintance with the English tongue. Indian proper names I have spelled as they are written and pronounced in India at the present time, 
and not as they were written and pronounced in the Sanskrit age. In this I am but following the practice of all modern languages. Nobody would now call London Londinium, or Marseille, Massilia, or Naples, Neapolis. Nor can I adopt the spelling of oriental words, which has been adopted in this country ostensibly for the use of continental scholars, which causes SH to be printed S acute, C cedilla, or S underdot, J G, C H K, etc. Such spelling is repulsive to many persons, and it can hardly be necessary for the oriental scholars of any country. The different N's, T's, R's and S's of Indian languages I have found it hopeless to represent, nor would it be useful for my work, for they are often confounded in Sikh literature. The spelling of English words is that accepted by the Clarendon Press. In the languages and dialects with which we have been dealing, there is no short E corresponding to the E in bed, and no short O corresponding to the O in not. Whenever, therefore, the vowels E and O are found in Indian names in this work, they are always long. E is always pronounced as it is in A, or as the French E acute. O is always pronounced as in note. The vowel I may be long or short. It is always long at the end of an Indian word, and is then pronounced like the English double E, E E. When it is long in the body of Indian words, Found in the notes, it is marked with a macron, thus, I macron. The vowel A may be also be either short or long. When long in Indian words in the notes, it is crowned with a macron, thus, A macron. The final A in Indian words may be generally considered short, like the A in sofa. In the text, in order not to distract the reader's attention, diacritical marks are rarely employed. This being essentially a work on the Sikh religion, we have commenced with Guru Nanak. But if the reader desires to follow the historical development of the Sikh Reformation, he had better begin with the sixth volume. This was probably the intention of Guru Arjan himself for otherwise he could not have included in his compilation hymns quite opposed to the principles and tenets of his predecessors. The author feels that his work suffers from a special disadvantage, because the scholars of Europe and America are hardly in a position to criticise on its merits the translation of hymns composed in dialects which can only be learned in India from the lips of the few exponents of the Sikh faith who now survive. Nor have European and American scholars had any opportunity of perusing the Indian works which form the basis of our lives, of the Gurus and of the saints who preceded them. The difficulty and extent of the author's labours cannot therefore be understood. It is believed that a work of this nature cannot be accomplished again. In any age it could not be done out of India for want of expert assistance. In India, even under the most favourable conditions, and when a student had acquired a knowledge of some Indian languages and dialects, the translation of the sacred books of the Sikhs and the compilation of the lives of their gurus and holy men would be the work of years. No one, while in the service of the Indian government, could find leisure to accomplish it, and few Europeans, after their retirement from Indian service, would care to spend long years and lonely lives in India wrestling with medieval Indian dialects and submitting to the caprices of Gyanis. But even should such martyrs to the cause of science be found, they would not be able to obtain the requisite assistance because the principal interpreters of the sacred books of the Sikhs will have passed away with this generation, 
and owing to want of patronage, there will be none to supply their place. The fact, too, would sooner render a sick, even if thoroughly acquainted with the English tongue, and possessed of sufficient resource and industry, incapable of producing an authoritative and exhaustive work in our language on his religion. The preacher of old said that of making many books there is no end. For the last century, their publication has increased in geometrical ratio, and prodigious must be the number which find their way into the streets and shops which sell quick quid chartis amicature ineptis. The author fondly hopes that this work, which contains an account of the last great religion of the world, which remains to be exploited, may escape the general fate. At the same time, a glance at the shelves of any large library must convince a writer of the vanity of most literary labour. If haply the love of fame is dearer to him, than the love of his subject. The blurred and hoary volumes, elaborately illuminated and bound, which no one now ever peruses, were often produced at the expense of years of toil, nay, of health and even life itself, and now remain sad monuments of the transitoriness of fame and the frequent futility of human effort. But there is even a worse fate than this, namely the obloquy so often meted out to authors instead of the legitimate recompense of lives of strenuous toil devoted to literary or scientific investigation. Even under favourable circumstances, the author of an elaborate work of this description the production of which has occupied several years of his life, cannot always hope, even for temporary reward, in the approbation of those dear to him, those whom he would wish to please. For either their measure of years has grown full, or separation and varied interests have dulled the feelings of mutual pleasure which would result from his success. Max Arthur McAuliffe, Royal Societies Club, London. End of section three.